Well, boys, looks like you started the fun without me. You're all sick. Every last one of you. We're going to need a bigger gun. What's the matter? You scared of things that go boom, boom, boom. My name is Eric. I'm here today with Michael Kester for another episode of Double Feature. That's two features in one podcast. It is. And what are the two features? Today we're going to do Harry Brown and Children of Men. So this is double bleak feature? Uh, Or double gay porno feature. I'm looking at my notes for the very first time and realizing that both Harry Brown and Children of Men could be misconstrued. Uh, for a second, I had no idea what you were talking yeah. about, and now I, it suddenly all makes sense. Uh-huh. Um, double bleak feature and double holy fuck feature. It's also a monumental day for our show because we finally found something to pair children and men with. We should have just done that earlier. Yeah, absolutely. So we're going to do Harry Brown first, and we're going to spoil the shit out of it. Mm-hmm. And we're uh, going to do children and men second. We're also going to spoil that. Yeah. I think Children of Men has more spoilers than Harry Brown does. As far as I'm concerned, every film has the exact same amount of spoilers. Certainly. Well, if spoilers are the kind of thing that concern you, yeah. you can use the chapters to skip right on past them. Mm-hmm. So uh, if you haven't seen Harry Brown, skip to Children of Men. If you haven't seen Children of Men, I will kick your ass. Uh, you need to see that. And if you haven't seen it, skip the fucking spoilers. Skip the whole goddamn conversation. Next week, we're doing the weird thing that we've been hyping yep. up for, uh, I don't know, a year now. Yeah, probably. Um, so we'll talk about that. That's exciting, too. But first and foremost, Harry Brown is... It's sad. This it's movie very makes me sad. sad. It well, makes you sad, too, right? Sure, anything, it's not just me. That's, anything that's centered around kind of the uh, last days of the elderly. Sure. The, uh, the end of one's life, really. It's, it's, about, it's about having nothing left to lose. Yeah. That's about... I mean, that's the premise of the film, really, yeah, sure. in a nutshell. Yeah, it's all the fucking characters, man. Whether it's Harry Brown reacting to, uh, you know, to the woman dying in the beginning mm-hmm. or to his fucking friend dying, people are dying all around him. And if the death wasn't enough, the only relief you get from the death is when he comes home from seeing all his friends die and sees all the fucking hooligans in the parking lot harassing everybody. Yeah. Just raping and pillaging down there. What the fuck is everyone's problem in this movie? That's just the way uh, England is, for real, in real life, really. It's, you know, I mean, it's good to remember that uh, life isn't Amelie all the goddamn time. Uh Uh-huh. Meaning there aren't vicious French people playing mean tricks on you. Yeah. But also, meaning that, you know, I like to think people are mostly good. Sure. There are evil people in the world. Uh Uh-huh. I don't know about evil like this movie purports. I mean, they're really fucking evil in this movie. I would not. I would not. And everywhere. Yeah, I would definitely argue that this film kind of sensationalizes British gang violence, though I have never been to England. However, I, as a humanist human being, and you as a humanist human being, find it difficult to believe that there is a group of people that big willing to stab an elderly man and pee on him. But that's what you want from movies, right? I will not comment on that. Sorry, that might have come out wrong. But you know what I mean. Uh Uh, Movies are a heightened sense of maybe not even reality, but a fantasy. And this movie is reminding us that there's evil in the world by showing how inhuman all of these people are. Yeah. Uh, They're not human beings at all. They don't even look like human beings visually. Yeah. So we get this interrogation scene where you kind of. Yeah. That's the first look you get at the individual hoods. And these aren't even the worst looking guys. No, no, not at all. But you get these individual hoods and they're all smart assing the police. Yeah. They've got it all figured out. Nothing can touch them. They've got a lawyer. They're all a bunch of fucking douchebag assholes. Every single one of them deserves to get slapped across the mouth. And they're dirty and gross. Yeah, and that's the first time you're one-on-one with a lot mm-hmm. of them. You get to see him before. I mean, you see him in the opening sure. in the shitty cell phone video footage. Right. I love that Harry Brown doesn't know how to work mm-hmm. the cell phone. Awesome. Make it work. And he's such a badass about it, too. There could have been a, a funny moment in there. There's no funny moments in Harry Brown. We don't no, have time for funny aren't. moments. So we see how awful the kids are just in that. That's a really good opening. Both of these movies today, great openings. Mm-hmm. Uh, you see those kids just... They have nothing to do. They're fucking on drugs. They're just causing trouble. They're shooting a mother for no reason, getting hit by buses, causing traffic jams in the street. I mean, it's really inconsiderate of them. The makeup job on these kids, I don't know how much goes into this. If it's makeup or part of it is just... Ugly British kids. Ugly British kids, casting. If these kids are all just naturally sweaty all the time. I mean, the tattoos, the scars, just the sweaty, dirty fucking junkies. They don't, they, they're closer to zombies than Mm -hmm. they are, or some kind of monster 
than they are uh, actual people, especially the people we see in the film. All the old nice people in the film. Yeah. Well, You're either an old nice person, a clean cop. Or, or the guy that gets stabbed to death. Or the guy that gets stabbed to death. So the movie's allowed to do a lot of this extreme stuff, not just for being a film, but for being a goddamn art film. Mm-hmm. It's uh, You can tell that visually looking at it, sure. the colorization, and the, the score especially is um, one of those things that it, it waves around a flag saying, yep. hey, I'm different than other films. Absolutely. It sets that mood. It sets that tone. It's... Um, more importantly, I guess it avoids the the awful score the swell stuff that we. <laughs> it uh, essentially avoids the whole film until the riot happens. Yeah, it's sparse. It's super, I think that's what yeah. you're getting at. I, is I, there's I rarely score. It's mostly piano and synth. Mm-hmm. I really wanted to come on the show and say it was all piano and synth. Yeah, but it's not. But it's not. There's some fake horn stuff and some string stuff in there too. The pieces are just as minimal as the instrumentation. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, most of them are based around two or three notes. A lot of them are based on a, a single pulsating tone. Mm-hmm. You know, the kind of theme that shows up in the beginning and reoccurs at least once later is just, uh, I think your left hand is holding down one note and your right hand is alternating between two other That's ones. That's called the uh, John Carpenter School of Score. And incredibly effective for two reasons. Just making you feel like... That's all that's left, right? Mm-hmm. That's all they've got yep. is one beat up junk keyboard and uh, everything else in the movie is desolate. It gives you this feeling of desolation. But also when you get to scenes like the riot at mm-hmm. the end, the score is pretty bummed that there's a riot. Yeah. This could have been the the death stomp, the stuff. I mean, when we were talking about Lost Highway, yeah. driver down at the end, that kind of, I mean, it's not that at all. Mm-hmm. It's It's somber. It's sad. These people are rioting and the film's not too happy about that. And you don't often get that from... Uh, let's call it a cleaning up the streets yeah. kind of movie. Right. A lot of times the revenge is really glorified. I mean, when you mentioned humanism earlier, I'm I'm starting to think that the movie, it's treating the violence in such a way where it's not, this revenge is necessary, this revenge must be done, but instead, oh, revenge is happening, and that yeah. kind of sucks too. Yep. All of this just kind of sucks, and the movie knows it. Not always the case in its predecessors. That's absolutely true. If you look at something like Death Wish, which got a ton of mention when Harry Brown came out, Death mm-hmm. Wish is a film from the 70s starring Charles Bronson. Actor, not boxer. Exactly. Takes revenge, gets a gun, cleans up the streets. You know, vigilante justice. That's the whole premise. Something we should definitely do on the show at some point. sure. The uh, Death Wish stuff. It's very, very similar to Harry Brown, except it's, like you said, it's a lot more... The vigilanteism is okay. By the end of by the end of the film, it's even kind of hey, that's cute. That's kind of Charles Bronson's little thing. He's yeah, right. Killing some hooligans and he's having a great time with it. Right. That's not the case with Harry Brown at all. He hates every time he has to kill somebody, but he hates them more. Harry Brown's a great character. The thing I love the most about his character is that he knows what he's doing. He's absolutely sure of what he's doing at all times. But you always believe this naive disguise he puts on. I mean, he's constantly going through the movie as if he's just a little humble old man and he doesn't he doesn't know anything Mm -hmm. about, you know, when he's talking to the police, when he's talking to the hoods, he doesn't know anything about their world. He just wants to sit at home and, you know, play chess. But that's not really who he is. No, you believe it every time it happens when he drops the money on the bar in the beginning. That's the first time that that's kind of, uh, you know, they put that test out to the audience to see if their ploy is working. He drops a bunch of money on the bar. And you think to yourself, I mean, at least I think to myself, God, that was stupid. That guy over there is going to see your money and follow you home. And just about the time my brain gets to the end of the thought, I go, oh, oh, yeah, that's that's probably his plan, huh? I think another good one is when he's buying the gun and, you know, you um, you see him go in there and he's talking about the uh, the pigeons and whatnot. And he's trying to speak to them as if he doesn't really know. Bumbling old man. He's just... talking like a guy who thinks he's street smart. Yeah. You know what I mean? Exactly. That's his disguise is he's a he's a guy who knows what's going on, pretending to be an old man who's pretending to know mm-hmm. what's going on. And you see the kids, you see the fucking thugs look at each other and kind of snicker at him and, oh, you want to buy some goods? You want to buy some mm-hmm. merchandise? Like, you don't even fucking know what you're talking about, old man. It totally works on them. Then he gets in there, and he just fucking owns everybody. He's right on top of his game. Down to the point where he he even kills the, I guess, what, the the head gun dealer? Sure, yeah. The boss of the company, and shoots him in the stomach, and gets stands over him and just dictates, you know, an old war memory of how a man just like him has died 
in the same way and it's brutal and terrible and he's going to hate it. Yeah, right. He's absolutely aware that he is about to be the uh, bringer of of death and revenge on these fuckers that have ruined not just his life, but his entire his community, his community's well-being. And, yeah. and this is where it comes back around to nothing left to lose. He's lost his family. Mm -hmm. He's lost his only friend. He's got emphysema. He's yeah, right. on his last leg as far he, you know, time limit. Time is ticking. Right, and right. He essentially makes the call. I'm going to die. If I go to jail for the next three years of my life, that's not going to be as much of a problem as these hoods are to my community. Well, even when he's talking to him in that instant, he's always Harry Brown. You know, he doesn't have to be master of disguises. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why he fools us. He doesn't play a completely different character when he goes in and talks to these hoods. Right. He, uh, you know, when there's finally a kind of turn and the guy realizes, you know, the thug realizes that, oh, this, this guy knows how to handle a pistol. Mm -hmm. This guy might know what he's fucking doing. Although it probably doesn't take a whole lot to one up a fucking junkie who's what smoking crack out of the barrel of his gun. Yeah. I don't even know what the, is it crack? It's probably pot. Oh, that's lame. I thought it was more hardcore than that. Pot's the one that's not hardcore, right? It depends on whether or not you're smoking out of the barrel of a Luger. Uh, good point. But when it's revealed that, oh, the old man knows what he's doing, it's not a totally different voice and charisma and character. He's talking to him about the same way he was talking to him before, except he doesn't have to show any concern for the poor girl who's right. ODing on the, mm -hmm. on the couch next to him. That whole scene, I mean, it's, the gun by scene is incredible. You can't believe how fucking despicable... Uh, grotesque these people are and once you get inside there it just fucking gets worse and worse it's just this den of you know disease and they're watching each other nail the chick or the one right. guy nail the chick on the they're TV. both nailing the chick yeah and they can't uh you know talking to them they're so fucking incoherent mm -hmm. the place is a mess you feel like you're gonna get aids just by sitting yeah. in there oh it's awful and when he finally gets out you know uh shortly after he's got this kid he well once he has the gun and this is another thing I love about the movie, Harry Brown, is when he shoots the guy in the car, you know, we're a couple scenes later now, the kid's giving head to the other guy in the car, and he shoots the guy. And when it shows, uh, you know, he's uh, a couple yards away, having fired the gun, he's not fucking around. He's fired the thing with two hands. He's taken his time to aim to make sure it's accurate. I mean, most time in a, in a movie, especially a movie that's about cleaning up the streets, we're meant to believe that the guy's just a badass, he can do whatever he wants, and the suspension of disbelief goes beyond that. Shoots the gun at a 90-degree angle without looking. That's it. Hip. And uh, Michael Caine shoots it like an old man who was trained to shoot a gun, uh -huh. would shoot a fucking gun. He takes his time, he makes sure you know he knows what he's doing, he uses both goddamn hands, because that's how you fire a gun if you want it to hit what you're pointing at, and he takes his shot. So I'm curious if you think the movie has a stance on... You know, vigilantism. I would definitely say that it still probably glorifies vigilantism, if only for the final shot of the film, mm -hmm. which is the thing you like so much where Harry Brown kind of is walking in his neighborhood and he decides, oh, sure. oh everything's nice and clean. I'm going to walk in this pedestrian tunnel that has been off limits for the right, remainder right. of the film. And I think that that's just kind of a message of he did it. He did it by himself. He took care of it. Sure. And now everything's okay. And and furthermore, he has not had any repercussions. So maybe in this scenario, vigilante justice was justified. That's what I would say the film is saying. Yeah, I think it definitely raises the questions. Um, the uh, You know, by showing the whole cop story mm -hmm. on the side, instead of it just being the sort of apathy, the... Uh, Oh, you cops aren't doing anything. The same thing the hood say that Harry Brown later expresses as well, why he goes into this, is uh, the cops weren't able to do anything. They're not going to help. Someone needs to take matters into their own hands. Mm -hmm. So the movie's bringing the questions up, but I don't know if it definitely provides an opinion. Or maybe it provides several opinions to kind of get you, you know, stuff to choose from. Certainly the last word is from Harry Brown. Oh, yeah. It's him, you know, walking through his clean, beautiful neighborhood. With this kind of look of uh, almost accomplishment at, you know, what's going on. But I don't know if there's definitely any social commentary to it. Maybe questions, but not... Uh, I think the fact that it's just a well-written and a gutsy kind of revenge film automatically makes you want to look for that sort of commentary. Mm -hmm. See if it's saying anything. But as you talked about earlier, having these over-the-top, you know, everybody is an evil human being... 
every single person under the age of 30 in this neighborhood is out to fuck with your car and your girlfriend and sell drugs. I don't think the movie honestly believes that. I think the movie is just trying to hype up the vigilante thing. Sure. Well, it's trying to make it a little bit more clean cut that they are doing bad killing and he is doing righteous killing. Sure. Not for a moral point, but for a cinematic point. Mm -hmm. I think the movie even goes out of its way to kind of give you a hint, you know, when they're talking about the chess game. When Emily Mortimer's uh, character Mm -hmm. comes over to talk to Harry Brown and they're talking about the chess game and how he's studying it, immediately you start thinking, oh, this is going to be a message about taking a new approach to whatever. And by the time they start to get to that level, uh, by the time they get to that point in his explanation, he cuts himself off and basically says, ah, fuck it, chess, boring. And they start talking about something else. It's just, uh, it's kind of saying sometimes a chess game is just a chess game. You can take things at face value. And this isn't me. This is the movie actually telling you this within the story. Mm -hmm. So maybe the police are useful in the end. Maybe it's Harry Brown who does all the cleaning up himself. Um, Maybe he's, uh, maybe all the movie's saying is that he's justified in trying it Mm -hmm. because he can't see the overall plan. Right. I mean, if you want to make that point that the movie's trying to validate uh, vigilantes, you could just as easily say, that the movie is also saying the police should be more transparent in mm. their inner working so that people yeah. like Harry Brown don't... So people know whether or not it's a good time to be a vigilante. <laughs> right. right, exactly that. So when is that time? I mean, there is a point for that, right? Mm-hmm. You and I, both pacifists, sure. probably wouldn't take guns out to the street, no. at least well, in the current state not of in affairs. A, not right? in a bad way. Yeah, yeah, I hear what you're saying. But I mean, to, uh, to defend ourselves or to take back our neighborhood... Sure. How bad I wouldn't would take things, action with a gun to the street. How streets. bad would things have to get? Maybe not for you or I, because we wouldn't do that. But for someone to be, let's say, ethically or morally validated in doing uh-huh. that. For me, I think the line would be drawn when I discovered that the law enforcement was actually working with whatever problem I had expected them so to like fix. So like Batman situation. That's what we're talking yeah, about. Something, well, something like, you know, you have drug dealers. Say there's some violent drug dealers sure. that are dealing down the street from you. You call the police. Some police officers show up. They go to the house. They say they go in there and let's for some reason you're omnipotent and you know that the police go in, go, listen, guys, you're getting a complaint. We need to keep. We need to tone this down. Otherwise, we're gonna. Our deal is off. Sure. And then they, you know, put their hand out and they're given a certain sum of money because that's their price of corruption. Right. Right. At that point, I would say you have no other alternative. If you want the problem solved, you either have to somehow go higher up in the police department. In which point, you could probably just assume the corruption goes to a higher level than you can reach. We're starting to talk LA Confidential again. Right, exactly. And and that's probably the point at which you have no other alternative than to take matters into your own hands. But the level of which you even do that has its own stipulation. Yeah, I mean, the corruption has to be nearly complete. Mm-hmm. Because if you can ever go somewhere else, if you can ever go one town over and say, hey, this town is being corrupt... I mean, when we're talking all the way to the top, that phrase has a lot of meanings. Mm -hmm. Is that the entire government of Britain that would then have to be corrupt in order to do that? Is it the sheriff? Is it the captain? Right. Is it the police commissioner? So we're starting to talk about a Mad Max scenario. Exactly. We're almost talking about a lawless society. We're one step removed from that. Uh There's a facade of the law. So that might be valid in doing that. And I think when we look at children and men, we get so far beyond that where it's a world where the police force is operating independently of the interests of the people, really. And so you don't even stop for a second to think about that, which signifies a great time, of course, to actually talk about the film Children of Men. I can't believe this is happening on the show. Children of Men is actually something that we can credit for being one of the fostering moments of double feature. Absolutely. If it weren't for Children of Men, you and I probably, I mean, we had watched a bunch of films together, but it was what? Fucking Grindhouse? Hot Fuzz yeah, right. and Ghost Rider. Yeah. I think we're, oh, that God. was about the level Awful. we were at. But we saw Children of Men and we had probably our first very meaningful conversation about insight into not only filmmaking, but the bullshit you download every week. That's the kind of yeah. conversation we had in my sure. car. We and, would be, what, playing video games with each other all the time? If that, we wouldn't have film conversations. Right. I mean, we still, we, while we're playing video games, we have film conversations. Right, right. But, and more importantly, I don't know if we would have ever done anything together. That's you know, probably we true. We have um, a lot of things that are just kind of always on the burner, but this project came out of a lot of other projects mm-hmm. that we were kind of working on and uh, still continuing to work on all the time because we 
can see what certain movies are doing. Sure. I remember there was a, a script thing we were working on right about when we started Double Feature a little bit earlier than that, somewhere between when Children of Men came out and uh-huh. Double Feature. And I remember Children of Men coming up all the time. Absolutely. That was just our, that was kind of our common language to speak with each other mm-hmm. about things films do or, or things we like that we didn't even know how to talk about at that point. Mm-hmm. So anyway, Children of Men, clearly a film near to both of our hearts and a great achievement in the cinematic experience. Yeah, it's hard to even know where to start on this and mm-hmm. how to possibly cover all the bases. We can't cover all the bases. No, we can't. If you're interested in Children of Men, you'll end up doing a lot more reading than this right. stupid little show. Hopefully you won't end up doing any reading on this show because we will have recorded it wrong if we force you to read something. Mm. Not how audio works. It starts with an explosive opening. A, uh, I mean, it's just a great open. You know, they're in the coffee shop. You're getting some details about you know, the world, and you're trying to really listen in to this news broadcast. About the death of baby Diego. Right, and it's such a smart move exposition-wise, because it's not telling you, as you all know, women are infertile, no one's given birth in X amount of years, whatever. Right. It's using the story of baby Diego in order to tell you that stuff. Right, and, and the big points that it kind of details right in the beginning of the film are the strongest things you're ever going to need to really know mm-hmm. to answer any questions you have about the future world that we're operating in because it's not given to you in any other way other than this news broadcast. You find out there are no more babies. It's happened 18 years ago and it happened in 2009 and it is now 2027. And while you're in learning mode, of course, the fucking coffee shop explodes. Yep. So that's the other half of Children and Men. Half of it is learning mode, great world, look at all this cool intellectual stuff. The other half is things explode and it looks really gorgeous. You're not prepared for that. It happens. It lets you know what kind of movie this is. It's the uh, sort of style of opening uh, we talked about in Martyrs. You drop in the title tag, fucking children of men. Here's what you're watching now. So it's a film by Alfonso Cuaron. Uh-huh. And, uh, he did e to Mama Tam- and he did E to Mama Tambien. Uh-huh. And uh, I think it was the third Harry Potter movie, okay, the Gary Oldman the one. Gary Oldman one, right. Prisoner, uh, Prisoner of, of Azkaban. Which is also kind of the art house Harry Potter. It's the one with the long takes, yep. which is weird. But not the only name that needs to be credited. There's also Emmanuel Lebeski. Okay, so the cinematographer. Right. And, uh, and this guy's worked on a lot of stuff that, unfortunately, I don't recognize. But the cinematography in this thing is incredible, and we'll get to it later. Well, he did um, Prisoner of Azkaban, if you need a reference. That's so strange, considering the rest of his work seems obscure. But, I mean, he's a Mexican cinematographer. He's mm-hmm. worked on a lot of stuff in Mexico. And although I can read Spanish, I don't recognize the titles, because apparently not as, uh, as famous in the United States. Thankfully for things like the internet, that's no longer a valid excuse I can use for, you know, having not seen his films. So he's in charge of a lot of the handheld camera work. Mm -hmm. In fact, he's the guy holding the camera in a lot of the handheld camera work. Not just barking orders, but literally on the roof of the car when they're shooting, you know, scenes like that. The thing that intrigued me the most uh, that I noticed the first time I saw Children of Men about the camera work, before I even realized that the long takes were long Mm -hmm. takes, is that the camera always pretty much without exception, follows Clive Owen. Yeah. I in think, literally every scene. I think the only exception to that rule is sometimes they'll do a pan where they'll be following Theo through, say, the street, uh-huh. and they'll pass by a Fuji cage, and the camera will stop as if floored by the gravity sure. of what is going on with these refugees. And immediately it the immediately the scene ends, it cuts, and we go back to Theo. Yeah, we go back to something else with Theo. So I think the idea was to do something uh, raw documentary style, mm-hmm. and that's where you get the handheld stuff, and that's where you get the stunned by images stuff. It's also an excuse to look around the world a bit, yeah. to kind of pause on propaganda posters and uh, on the general imagery that you know would be sure. catching your eye. You don't have to brush past that, because the movie's shooting it in a style where you're comfortable lingering on that. It doesn't feel like the movie's saying, hey, look at this poster right. we made. It's this not poster's beating really you cool over the head with something like mandatory fertility tests. Sure, right. But it's there, and it's not obscured in a way where you have to be peering into the background to find out what's going on. It's there. You can read it. The pace is such that you don't have to worry about missing something when you're looking around mm-hmm. what's going on, but none of it is ever clearly there to be in the frame. And that's the brilliance of choosing this style for a... A sci-fi, not-too-distant-future story like this. Uh The other thing it accomplishes is that everything in the entire movie becomes from Theo's perspective. Even stuff you see from the outside. Stuff where normally the movie would cut to, 
you know, when they first get back to the uh, the little camp they've the set safe up, the house. little yeah, the safe house, right? The kind of renegade bunker, the that unsafe they have. safe house. So there's a conversation that happens inside that the audience needs to hear to understand why the plot's moving in a certain direction. If the audience needs to hear it, Theo needs to hear it. Mm-hmm. So we have Theo sneak outside. The camera follows him. The camera goes with him as if he's got, you know, a documentary crew right. traveling with him at all times. And then it just kind of comes up to the window a little bit. After it lingers at the window for a few seconds, we feel just as if we were inside listening to this conversation. Right. But in fact, we are still outside with Theo. And that also makes the movie more personal. It's so easy in science fiction to get lost in the world, to get lost in things being flashy and to miss that human element. Yeah. And if the fucking movie is going to be about the inevitability of death and the end of the human race, that has to be a personal story. Oh, yeah. You can't make that about, you know, fancy cars flying through the air. Or it raining all the time. But that future makes it so rewatchable because there's so many things mm-hmm. to pick up on. Um, there's some religious commentary. That's probably one of the more obvious things. Yeah, for sure. The rebounders or repenters or... Just uh, just letting us know that we have religion in the future, uh-huh. and it's still stupid. Right. Well, and they kind of highlight this with Miriam, mm-hmm. who's... A uh, little nutty. She Yeah, she's nutty, and she's all into the... It's more than being religious. She's into the supernatural. She's interested in UFOs. I believe spiritual is the term. Yeah, supernatural. Um, she she does uh, god yoga or whatever. <laughs> yeah, right. I love that scene, because Key mocks her, mm-hmm. right? As doing well, her everybody voodoo shit. mocks her. She yeah. she kind of does. It's as if she's doing her own thing, and everybody's like, "But she's such a good midwife, right. That we're gonna let her and her dreadlocks say shanti shanti shanti, and everybody's gonna pretend that they believe it, or at least not tell her she's wrong." Yeah, she's not a bad person. We treat her with respect, as we can treat religious people. We treat their ideas as if they're retarded because they are, and that's how the movie looks at the situation. It also takes time to make little jabs like Theo, I'm a virgin, Mm -hmm. which is about the funniest thing that ever fucking happened. Yeah, it's really good. The uh, Immaculate Conception. The Immaculate Conception is not one of the funniest things that ever happened. It's the joke about it in the film. Only because it didn't happen. If it did, it would be pretty fucking funny. It's great because they give it this pause where the audience has the same reaction as Theo. Mm-hmm. And we have to because we're following him the whole movie. Of you course mean we the, the audience reaction. vomits? Oh no, this great film is starting to betray. Sure, it's sure. unraveling in my fingertips. Well, especially if you're anything like us and you're watching incredible. Which I am. <laughs> yeah, you certainly are. Uh, you're watching an incredible movie for the first time, waiting for it to destroy itself. Exactly. That's all I'm ever watching. A good mm-hmm. every time a good movie happens, I think, wow. You think here comes high tension? Yeah, here's where the here's where the suck's going to come on. Twelve minutes from the end. Part of the future world is also the propaganda posters. Mm-hmm. So you mentioned uh, you mentioned one of them about fertility tests, mandatory fertility tests. Right, right. Which other ones stand out to you? Uh, quietus, but that's a huge oh, yeah, yeah. kind of aspect of the film, which is um, what self self inflicted suicide. I sure. guess all suicide is self inflicted, but it's government issued right. suicide. Times are fucking bleak, man. And it's there's the catchphrase is uh, when you're ready or on yeah, your own time. <laughs> yeah, or sure, sure. At your leisure. Something stupid like that. Right. Oh, the the other big propaganda ones that I really like are the, um, she's my neighbor, she's my grandfather, yeah, yeah. she's my librarian, right. and then refugees are illegal. Sure. And then uh, only Britain soldiers on. That's yep. probably my favorite one. Well, it has a double purpose. Mm-hmm. It lets you know something about immigration and why it's sure. happening and what's going on. But it also tells you, forget the rest of the world. Right. It, We're not going to talk about instead it. Of, instead of raising the questions or having some expositional bullshit dialogue, because... So we're 18 years into this into this problem. Mm-hmm. We're 18 years into infertility. Yeah, people aren't gonna they, they can't do the what the women in prison thing. Bring the new girl in; she gets all the information. Right, because There's everybody no knows. People. Right, you can't do. Well, wait, what happened in America? I, sure, I I, for, I have amnesia. Instead, commercial. Don't worry about the rest of the world. Not the point of the film. We're in Britain. Britain is the only country. Okay, Fuji's and explosion. That's great too because it falls into the thing that we're always talking about, which is drop you into a scenario, pick up the details as you go on. There's some vague references to bombing events, how the fishes well, used to it, do things. Right when it cuts to New York in the what happened to the world, there's right. a mushroom cloud. Yeah, and it's tiny details like that. That takes what seven frames in yeah. the entire movie. I mean, it's about a second and a half of footage, if that. It's one of the things you look for as you rewatch the movie. You know what I love is all the report suspicious activity stuff. Mm-hmm. I love that because it hits close to home, both the way that phrase is meant, but also literally in Chicago. Right. We have these atrocious banners, and, uh, and I've seen a lot of other cities that have kind of similar things. 
But the the kind of see something, say something banners that appeared after 9-11. Right. We have, um, I'm sure you've seen these things, the stealing or snuggling thing, or what does it say? I have no idea. Uh, snuggling or snatching. It's these pictures of, you know, a purse that uh, if you're on the L or if you're on one of the buses, I think they're more prominent. I take the L a little bit more. I, I think take you probably buses take almost everywhere. Yeah. So maybe it's just on the L. Wow. I haven't been on a fucking bus in a while. Anyways. Uh, so if you're on the L, you see these things. And it's a picture of like some binocular eyes and a purse. And it's basically trying to make you think, hey, that person sitting next to you, are they to be trusted? And they have a whole series of these. The snuggling or snatching one is really the worst one. I think that one has actually an arm around somebody with like a hand in the wallet. But it's basically to make you doubt your fellow citizen, to make you think anybody could be stealing from you or trying to rape you or planting a bomb on the L. It's about the most horrendous public campaign I've ever seen right here in my fucking city. It's I had awful. no idea that that was going on. Oh, man, I'll send you some. Pi- you know what I'll do no. is I'll put pictures up on the site. There we go. Doublefeatureshow.com under this uh, under the Harry Brown Children Men episode. Um, and if people want to email us, I'll go ahead and throw those on there, too. Fucking awful. So some of the tidbits about the world we really get when we're in people's homes. Mm -hmm. We get them when we're dealing with the kind of slums later. Sure. Which I love that, you know, we're in a slum, but there's still plasma TVs laying around in the garbage. It's almost like the, it's a, what, a prison camp? It's a ghetto. It's the ghetto from back Third Reich, Happy Time, uh, Great Dictator land. And subtle references to that, too. It's not really overbearing. Look, it's like World War II now. It just reminds you naturally of, you know, ghettos in any other time of war. Except that they have LCD TVs because they're in the future. Mm -hmm. Awesome. So when they're in a home there, or specifically when they're in Jasper's place, Mm -hmm. Jasper, who, by the way, is fucking hilarious in this movie. Oh, yeah. He's the the comic relief. And that's why it's such an incredible move to kill him because no more jokes. Jasper dies and there goes all the lightheartedness of the film. Gravity takes hold. Stop expecting jokes. That's yeah. not true. And Sid the last comes thing in he, for a little while. Sure. Sid's a little funny. Only briefly. And then car battery, Sid's gone. Yeah, he's funny, but he's dangerous funny. He's not pull my finger funny, right. which is oddly the last thing Jasper says, yeah. which is pretty amazing. But when you're hanging out in his home, I mean, it's rich with content. You see stuff from the Iraq war. You see stuff that's, uh, you know, that was definitely going on at the time the film came out. And unfortunately, it's still going on, you know, even as we're watching the film now five years later or whatever. And you start to question how they got to the point they did today. Uh, a question that's only vaguely poked at, never even really. I mean, I think Jasper says it once in in the joke, and they use it in the trailer. You know, when he's telling the joke, you're still right about comic relief. He's literally telling a joke, but he's saying, uh, you know, why can't women have babies anymore? Mm-hmm. But that's a, that's part of the setup to his joke. It's not a question. It's again another one of these double purposes. The audience literally says, "Well, hold on, I actually want the answer to that question." And Jasper, you know, scolds Theo and says, hey, I'm telling a joke here. Right. And he also answers it by saying, we don't know when he says, you know, the scientists say it's pollution. It's too many science experiments. It's this. It's that, you know, all the normal the stuff usual. that people yeah, come up right. with. So, yeah, Jasper gets killed off. But Jasper is not the first one to go. No. There's this incredible car assault scene. Uh-huh. And I like the flashy long takes or at least the illusion of long takes. Right. However, I think uh, between the seven and a half minute one that right. happens later and the car assault. Oh, car assault every time for me. I mean, it's really incredible. The amount of things that are packed in this tiny little scene. You have uh, a camera crew that's, I guess they're riding on the, the top of the car. Uh-huh. Although I thought they were actually nested somehow. There was one camera guy nested inside but but unfortunately you can't just have one dude shooting your entire movie mm-hmm. you need sound and your director of photography mm-hmm. and you know you need a, a, at least four people apparently to pull off a scene like this so you put him on the roof the scene starts brilliantly with the ping pong thing which forces the uh you know they're spitting the ping pong ball between their mouths right so already the audience is paying attention to the visuals they're looking for edits mm-hmm. right they're saying oh cool how did they do that i wonder if there was a splice so, of course, they do it once more. So the audience is trying to scrutinize the frame. And that's the point where the happy fun moment turns to emergency. Turns to a burning car rolling through the trees. Right, right. You get these hordes of people coming out of the fucking forest. And there's fire going against the hood of the car. And the glass is cracking. The glass eventually breaks. Meanwhile, the camera hasn't cut a, a single right. fucking time. It's just kind of looking to the right, looking to the left, slowly panning to get everybody's reaction Instead of making a solid edit from one scene, look in the back of the car, look in the front, Mm -hmm. get an outside view. It's in the car with you. You're stuck in the car with Theo. And eventually there's police that show up. The police pass them by 
and the police even come back. And when they shoot the police, it's at this moment that you notice, uh, you know, the car whizzes away. And at some time in there, you go, hey, wait a second, I got out of the car at some point. You know, in that giant flashy scene, so much was going on, I wasn't even paying attention. And now the cameraman is somehow outside the vehicle and they have left Mm -hmm. down the street. Just makes you want to watch it again and figure out when all these points, how this thing was orchestrated. Well, yeah. And I mean, I don't know how you missed this, but this is also the scene where they killed Julian. Yeah, of course. Of course. They put a bullet in Julian's head and Julianne Moore, who's the actress that plays Julian. Mm -hmm. Hey, thanks for that name problem is probably, at least at the time of the film, the most famous actor involved with the project. Yeah, debatably Clive Owen got a lot of work after Children of Men, but I don't know. I I mean, he was uh, working before, but I would say it it doesn't matter. She's either first or second billed as the celebrity. And within, what, this is max 40 minutes into the film, probably less. They kill her off, and she does not. She doesn't even have a line. Nope. She gets shot in the throat, and that's it. There is no more Julian. Yeah, she's shot. She's dead. We don't get one more moment to for Theo to confess his love. I mean, it doesn't happen. Mm-hmm. It sucks. You die. It's over. And furthermore, she's probably the most important part of the entire plan. Right, and they're screwed after that. That immediately takes hold. They're screwed. So this has now accomplished two things. We've taken a scene that would have been a 10 or maybe a 20-shot scene, and we've done it in a single take. Uh, something like we've seen in Serenity, or I know the first time we talked about this was probably uh, Touch of Evil, that that original scene that appears in the film. The thing that's to be marveled is, I mean, the orchestration, mm-hmm. the timing, the uh, the perfection. It's like watching several uh, Rube Goldberg machines, you know, interlocking, go off in perfect synchronicity, in, in flawless sync, and one thing just hits after another. Um, you see that in the final scene even more because it's, one longer and two has way more effects mm-hmm. in it. So there is one more, again, a longer. It's seven I guess, and a half minutes. Sure, it's, it's really long. It's a seven and a half minute. It looks like a single shot, but it's sure. actually divided into maybe five. Right. And this is the other scene where we get our other protagonist shot. So the two most impressive scenes also happen to be the two most depressing scenes. This is war and there are fucking stakes. That's Absolutely. just how it has to be. Sure. This is a scene that took apparently two weeks to set up and five hours to reset every time they did it. That is insane. Mm -hmm. So I wish I knew more about uh, the setup for these things, but I was under the impression that the blood on the lens was digital. Mm -hmm. And in looking that up, because we questioned that when we saw it on the movie, it appears that the blood on the lens was accidental Mm -hmm. and that they decided to keep it. But without hearing it out of the director's mouth or out of the cinematographer's mouth, I just, I can't verify any of that. So I once again, don't know what I'm talking about. Still phenomenal. The fact that everybody has to do this incredible job acting Mm -hmm. up front. I know that was something we focused on with Serenity because that is one seamless take sure. and it's all people talking. And if anybody fucks up or doesn't know their character, right, or you makes just a weird have to, noise by mistake. Yeah. You just have to do the whole thing again. So this take starts out with a large confrontation, a lot of people, and they just keep amping things up. Mm-hmm. You know, you have to imagine the camera guy following Theo around and the sound guy also trying to stay out. They can't have any shadows in there. They have to have all these different explosions going off at the same time. And the extras can't fuck up either. Literally no one can fuck up Mm -hmm. anything or they have to reset and they have to try and get another usable take. But when they get the baby and they're out of there, the ending is, I don't know, it's bittersweet, right? Uh, By definition, it has to be. It's bleak because Theo is laying on a boat shot, probably dead. He's dead. He's clearly dead. Well, he's dead. And I mean, the worst part is that he doesn't know if the thing's coming. Right. He He dies before the tomorrow shows up. Well, the nature of the whole mirror setup that they had, and you know, he talked about this. That's a great scene with Miriam. Uh, Just when they're on the bus, they're having a conversation. Nothing is necessarily moving the plot forward, except, I guess, physically the bus. Uh But in conversation, they finally sit down and talk about how the system's going to work. And Miriam reveals that they've never actually talked to anybody for the human project. They don't know anybody there. They were using a complicated system of telephone to fucking find anything out. And you just see this wave of disappointment Mm -hmm. and disillusionment really he almost slaps his hand to his forehead and says fuck you guys haven't been talking to anybody as if this could all be for nothing it seems to go back to that conversation he had when he was trying to get the immigration papers Mm -hmm. you know how why do you care about all this art what does this matter and the other guy says well i just try not to think about it that seems to be the approach he takes at the end of the movie i'm going to try and get you through this even if we get to the boat because he doesn't seem to become discouraged after that he's still really trying to make it to the end well, he's Even, already in a situation where he can't go back at that right, point. Right, right. 
it's all or nothing now. And he gets on the boat and he dies with Key shouting at him, look, the boat. And that's it. Mm -hmm. Cut to child sounds. I didn't think I would ever want to hear child sounds in my entire life. I guess so we cover Children of Men. Finally. It's, it's over now. three of double feature. I really, if there was ever a movie where we could have done, uh, people ask every once in a while if we could do commentary to line up to their uh -huh. DVD. That's a terrible idea, by the way, because this show takes lots of preparation and editing, and we don't actually know an hour's worth of stuff about anything. Right. But I do feel like about every five seconds in Children of Men, I want to point at something and say, ooh, look at that. Mm-hmm. Something tells me, over or not, this might not be the last Children of Men, at least Children of Men-related rant you hear uh, on the show. All right. Well, until then, you can uh, go see some of our other features on doublefeatureshow.com. And there's an email address, doublefeatureshow at gmail.com. Send us your suspicious citizen posters, mm -hmm. your fucking big brother ugly disgusting shit that your government has put up in their public transportation system posters. Devil Feature Show at gmail.com. And then this would be the part where we would talk about donations like <laughs> five weeks ago. Yeah, right. But now we are actually going to have to talk about what the donations have turned into. And this is all... I'm scared already. Yeah, are you ready for the big reveal? I've got no, it here. No, I'm not. But I, I'm already at a point where we've told people... We've taken their money, right? We have the money. We appreciate the money. But now we actually have to do something about it, and that's just that's not going to be something I'm going to go into willingly, but I will go into it with my fucking sword raised. So what are we doing? I don't even know what we're doing. All right, we got a 2009 film that a listener named Mike submitted called Mary and Max, and we're going to be pairing it up with an old Stanley Kubrick movie that, uh, that Ty wanted to do called the killing okay well thanks you two uh i'm gonna i'm gonna fucking bring it i have to bring it you guys have given me this challenge you guys have given us both this challenge so i guess it's time for us to watch more fucking film bye <laughs>